A number of colleagues, you all can go ahead and take a seat. This is a round table, so we will not be swearing in witnesses. Besides knowing all your backgrounds, I'm not concerned about your truthfulness. Um, I uh, appreciate you being here today. There are a number of senators that are going to be coming in and out uh, over the next period of time. So please indulge their rudeness as we all have 16 places to be at once. So you come when you can and you leave and you come back and you leave. That's not a reflection on the importance of this subject or on uh, the important witnesses we have in front of us. According to one longtime drug dealer in Dent County, Missouri, just down Route 72 from Rolla, where uh, the hospital is located where I was born, diverting prescription opioids to the black market is as easy as making an appointment. I get my pills from a crooked doctor, he explained. It's kind of like a speakeasy in the old days. You go into his office and tell him exactly what you want, and you're there for like a max of two minutes. Then you go to the pharmacy, and it's all the same people there waiting to get their script for their script to get filled. This same scenario has played out across Missouri and across the country as prescription opioids have flooded our communities. The pills arrive through legal channels, prescribed by physicians, manufactured by major pharmaceutical companies, and shipped by some of the largest corporations in the United States. Over just six years, for example, drug distributors shipped 780 million hydrocodone and oxycodone pills to West Virginia, enough to provide 433 pain pills for every resident of the state. A single pharmacy in the town of Kermit, population 392, that is 392 people, received 9 million hydrocodone pills over a two-year period, even as the surrounding Mingo County population suffered the, first, the fourth highest rate of prescription opioid overdose in the entire country. Under the law, drug distributors have an obligation to monitor, investigate, and report suspicious orders of opioids to the Drug Enforcement Administration. But according to the Washington Post, at least 13 distributor, distributors, including three companies that control 85% of all U.S. Pharma pharmaceutical distribution, let me repeat that, three companies that control 85% of all U.S. pharmaceutical distribution, quote, knew or should have known that hundreds of millions of pills were ending up on the black market. In some cases, distributors continued to send pills even after they were alerted to suspicious pain clinics or pharmacies by the DEA and their own employees. At the same time, the CEOs of the three major distributors have collected compensation worth more than $450 million just since 2012. Instead of responding to these challenges by ramping up actions against distributors, public reporting now suggests the DEA built roadblocks against aggressive action. As former DEA attorneys lobbied old colleagues to slow their efforts, DEA leadership reportedly imposed higher burdens of proof for moving forward with enforcement actions. DOJ officials allegedly even chastised employees at the often of diversion control for, quote, going after the industry. The result, as Chief Administrative Law Judge John Mulrooney noted in a 2014 report, was, quote, an alarmingly low rate of agency diversion enforcement activity on a national level relative to the historical data. In fact, civil cases against private actors in the opioid pop pipeline dropped from 131 in fiscal year 2011 to only 40 in fiscal year 2014. And the number of immediate suspension orders fell from 65 to single digits in the same period. Two years later, distributors went in for the kill. In March 2016, the Ensuring Patient Access and Effective Drug Enforcement Act, a bill reportedly written by a former DEA official turned industry executive, passed the Senate by unanimous consent and became law on April 19, 2016. 
Under the law, DEA now has a nearly impossible standard to meet when it seeks to immediately suspend drug shipments upon finding an imminent danger to public health or safety. DEA must also provide a distributor with the opportunity to submit a corrective action plan and must consider that plan before moving forward with revoking or suspending a registration under normal circumstances. According to Judge Mel Rooney, quote, if it had been the intent of Congress to completely eliminate the DEA's ability to ever impose an immediate suspension on distributors or manufacturers, it would be difficult to conceive of a more effective vehicle for achieving that goal. I certainly understand the concern that overzealous enforcement actions could potentially block patient access to necessary medication. But it's truly outrageous that at the height of the opioid crisis, distributors would use this concern to justify stripping DEA of its ability to police the drug delivery pipeline. As the final report of the President's Commission on Combating Drug Addiction and Opioid Crisis recently noted, quote, DEA must be able to successfully disrupt the diversion of prescription opioids at any and all points in the supply chain. I agree. That's why I've introduced a bill to restore DEA enforcement authorities and repeal what has been called the crowning achievement of the distribution industry. Over 40 state attorneys general from across the country have rallied behind this legislation. And I urge all my colleagues, and particularly Chairman Grassley and other members of the Judiciary Committee, to join me in this effort. I will continue to press forward with the first major congressional investigation into the role of opioid manufacturers and distributors in fueling this epidemic. We need every tool at our disposal to stem the flow of, flow of opioids, and I will continue to fight to ensure that fueling the black market in Dent County and anywhere else takes more than simply making an appointment. Today, I want to give fellow members of Congress and the pu public an opportunity to hear from former DEA officials who served on the front lines of this fight. Our panelists for this roundtable are Joseph Ranazisi. Ranazisi, is that right? What, what was your nickname? Joe. Joe. <laughs> That's my husband's name. That comes easily to me. Former DEA Deputy Assistant Administrator and Head of the Office of Diversion Control. Frank Yonker, for, former Division Group Supervisor in the DEA Cincinnati Resident Office. And Jonathan Novak, a former DEA Enforcement Attorney. Uh, Senator Hassan, I know this is a huge problem in your state also. Would you like to say a few opening remarks before we turn um, to the panelists for their opening statements? Well, thank you, Senator McCaskill, um, and thank you to the witnesses for being here today and for your work at the DEA for so many years. And to Senator McCaskill's point, uh, yes, my home state of New Hampshire has been devastated by this epidemic. And so it is really critically important that Congress ensure that the Drug Enforcement Administration Agency can effectively carry out its mission of protecting the American people. We are grappling in New Hampshire with a fentanyl, heroin, and opioid crisis and the human and economic cost to that crisis in our little state of 1.3 million people is just truly staggering. Drug diversion and dishonest prescribing practices like the infamous pill mills fuel this epidemic, and the DEA is critical to combating that source of dangerous drugs. The agency has real expertise on this issue, and so it is truly unfortunate that the DEA has decided to deny Chief Administrative Law Judge Mulroney the chance to participate in this discussion today. He has valuable experience and insight, and I really think it's a shame that he isn't able to be here to offer that to us today. Having said that, I appreciate the chance to hear from all of you, uh, whose knowledge and experience as a group is something that I think will really help us shed a light on how we can come together to protect our communities from problematic bad actors. So again, Senator McCaskill, thank you for your leadership in this. I'm honored to be on your bill uh, with you, uh, and I hope our colleague, more of our colleagues will join us, uh, and I look forward to hearing from our witnesses today. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Hassan. And the former ranking and of the Department of, of the Homeland Security Committee and Government Oversight Committee. Senator Carper, would you like to say a few words? Uh, I'm just delighted to be here. Thank you all for coming and thank you for, uh, for holding this. Sure. Happy to be by your side. And it's, it's great to be referred to as Puba. When I was Governor of Delaware, it was Excellency. Now I get here, it's Puba. There you go. Mr. Ranazisi, if you would begin. 
Thank you, Senator McCaskill and Senator Hassan and Senator Carper. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to participate in this roundtable discussion to discuss the Insuring Patient Access and Effective Drug Enforcement Act of 2016. I want to acknowledge for the sake of transparency that I've been opposed to all iterations of this legislation from early 2014 to my removal and retirement in 2015. During my tenure as senior executive in charge of the DEA Office of Diversion Control, the agency made clear certain, to certain congressmen senators that this bill would be harmful to DEA operations. DEA opposition was consistent and unequivocal until Charles Rosenberg assumed leadership of the DEA. Shortly thereafter, I was replaced. My senior staff was removed from leadership positions within the Diversion Control Program, and at this juncture, DEA appeared to withdraw opposition to the bill opening the door for the legislation to be passed and signed into law to the detriment of this country. I have listened to members of Congress say that DEA had the opportunity to oppose the bill but didn't. This is very misleading. The legislation made substantial changes to longstanding provisions of the Controlled Substances Act that in effect prevent DEA from issuing immediate suspension order against manufacturers and distributors. The ISO stops the distribution of controlled substances at the moment the ISO is served and works to prevent imminent danger to public health or safety. Historically, the ISO was judiciously deployed in the most egregious circumstances as an action of last resort. I have often referred to some of the pharmacies and pain clinics where DEA would typically issue ISOs as modern day crack houses. People were lined up to get opioids and benzodiazepines and prescriptions were dispensed by practitioners and filled by pharmacists without determining whether those prescriptions were issued for legitimate medical purpose or within the usual course of professional practice. In these cases, DEA would not only issue ISOs to diverting pharmacies or physicians in those rogue clinics, but also issue ISOs to the distributors who supplied the pharmacies and in some cases clinics. These distributors posed an imminent danger to public health and safety by consistently failing to follow the, through on their obligations under the Controlled Substances Act and implementing regulations. They disregarded the requirement that they file suspicious order reports with DEA defined by the regulations as unusual, uh, orders of unusual size, unusual frequency, or outside an usual normal, uh, normal ordering pattern. They either failed to see diversion was occurring, these pharmacies, or just ignored diversion that was occurring. In either case, performing due diligence of the customers and orders could have prevented millions of doses of opioids and benzodiazepines from going downstream. Then in 2016, the law changed. At the behest of corporations, the Insuring Patient Access Act raised the bar to issue the ISO to an almost impossible standard. The new law defines imminent danger narrowly and makes it virtually impossible for DEA to make the required findings at the distributor and manufacturer level since they're too far upstream from the ultimate user. The clear net effect is that distributors and manufacturers are protected from government discontinuing their operations immediately, regardless of how egregious the violations are or how, how unbridled the diversion of controlled substances. I'll fully acknowledge that DEA ISOs, the ISO process, was successfully challenged five times in 45 years. In my opinion, only one of those five cases was an inappropriate application of the ISO, and that case was adjudicated in 1975. The second problem with the new law requires DEA to provide notice to a registrant that it may submit a corrective action plan or cap that may be considered by DEA before the date of any administrative hearing. Before the law requiring a cap, any mitigating factors, including corrective action, were taken into account before a decision was rendered. Now under the new law, this type of information must be considered in light of whether a revocation proceeding should continue or, whether, uh, continue or whether the cap needs to modify, amend, or clarify. As a result, there's no incentive to self-report, self-inspect, or act to deter or prevent diversion until violations are actually discovered. I can't say it any more plainly than that. However, Chief Judge John J. Mulrooney explains it brilliantly in his soon-to-be-released Marquette Law Review article. Judge Mulrooney stated that the provision is akin to a state legislator mandating that law enforcement authorities allow shoplifting suspects caught in the act to outline how they intend to replace purloined items on the store shelves. This can't be more ridiculous. These drugs kill thousands of people every year, and now the law allows handlers of these drugs to be reticent in their duties, ignorant of their duties, and ignore their duties until DEA specifically tells them what they're doing wrong. The, the Enforcement Act uh, 
renders the agency helpless and changes uh, to change the recidivism in an industry that has contributed greatly to the opioid and pharmaceutical abuse epidemic and has become a major public health and safety issue. And in closing, I just want to say one thing. I've heard that people keep saying that, well, we're not worried about the act because we have voluntary surrenders in our tool chest to go after these people. When people say that, they just show their ignorance of the law. A voluntary surrender is not an immediate suspension order. An immediate suspension order is a judicial action where I go in and there is no choice in the matter. I'm going to take your registration and you'll be afforded due process quickly. A voluntary surrender, the agency is at the behest of the company. And I've asked for voluntary surrenders and big companies don't want to give it especially these companies, since they're the companies that push this legislation through. I want to thank you, and I'm more willing to answer any questions you have. Thank you. Senator McCaskill, Senator Hassan, Senator Carper, distinguished members and guests. I am privileged, privileged to have been invited to speak at this forum on a subject that has been a part of my life for the better part of 30 years. The scourge and current epidemic of prescription opioid drug abuse has been ongoing for the entire time I have worked for the Drug Enforcement Administration and continue to this day. For those of us who have and continue to work on the front lines battling this epidemic and have lived this issue, the opportunity to help stem the tide is greatly appreciated. Opioid abuse is a problem that crosses all demographic, all party lines and all income levels. There is no one in this room who hasn't felt the problems and effects of this epidemic. Suggestions on how to solve this problem have been plenty. Actual actions have been few and far in between, and in some cases, some actions have been detrimental. By appearing here today, I will answer all questions honestly and openly. In those answers, I hope the distinguished members present here today will be able to find a common ground in coming up with actions and solutions that can help stem this terrible epidemic. Again, I thank you for the opportunity to appear at this meeting today. Thank you, Mr. Yonker. Mr. Novak. <clears throat> Good afternoon, and thank you for the honor of speaking here today as part of this roundtable. From 2010 through 2015, I had the great honor to serve as an attorney for the Drug Enforcement Administration. For several years under amazing leadership and with an eye on protecting the public health and safety, DEA shut down pill mills and practices run by greedy, immoral drug dealers in lab coats, all betraying not only their duties under the CSA, but their ethical obligations to their fellow human beings. I watched as DEA fought hard against the rising tide and struggled not to drown as the opioid epidemic swelled all around us. Then, for no readily apparent reason, DEA began to slow down, not ramp up its enforcement. A new section chief arrived, and with him, inexplicable new standards for charging cases were put into place. Soon, attorneys for DEA were being shut down. Draft pleadings would go through farcical rounds of edits and re-edits. New policies were drafted and enacted unilaterally by the section chief, declaring higher standards of proof, unfounded new demands on field investigators, an increased need for the use of expert witnesses, and more so, an almost palpable fear of using DEA's strongest tool for enforcement, the immediate suspension order. Uh, the, the immediate suspension order was, in essence, the only way to get a distributor, manufacturer, or large pharmacy chain to listen and comply with its obligations under the CSA. During my time at DEA, it seemed to me that these larger corporations in, in the industry were not interested in doing the right thing, at least not until their profits were hurt and their names were being tied to the opioid epidemic in the headlines. When the new section chief began running my section, discussions turned to an almost palpable fear that if DEA utilized the ISO and one of these larger companies challenged the ISO, DEA could receive a bad ruling against it in federal court, which could ultimately take away DEA's ability to use the ISO at all. This fear appeared to be based largely on the fact that DEA had begun losing some of its best, brightest, most driven, and most talented attorneys. A former section chief was hired into private practice to represent one of the largest opioid distributors in the country. 
Soon after, DEA began losing more and more attorneys recruited over to represent the industry. I need to note that it has never been my intention to vilify any of these attorneys. These men and women represent friends and mentors, and I was very saddened to see them leave, not only because I still had so much to learn from them, but because I would miss their everyday presence in my life. However, uh, the, with, with everything, <clears throat> sorry, however everything has turned out, it has been an honor to have worked with the attorneys and the employees that graced the halls of DEA. And I doubt I will ever find a more dedicated team of men and women to work with. But when these attorneys left for the industry, they brought with them an intense and brilliant understanding of DEA regulations and case law. I believe that this brilliance and understanding, now representing some of the largest DEA registrants in the country, was what DEA began to fear. This was, to my understanding, what caused much of the slowdown in DEA enforcement actions. During the slowdown, two things became immediately apparent. The first was that nearly all the DEA um, teams of attorneys, diversion investigators, group supervisors, diversion program managers, and headquarters employees all continued to do their jobs with the utmost diligence, honesty, hard work, and skill that ever they had. I mention this because my participation in the 60 Minutes in Washington Post investigations led several of my former colleagues to get a little defensive about the tone of those pieces. And they noted that some of the best work they had done in their careers was during this slowdown. And I don't disagree with that at all. One of the best cases that's ever come out of DEA came out during this slowdown, Masters Pharmaceuticals. Uh, it provides case law clarifying the obligations on the distributors in terms of due diligence and reporting suspicious orders. And it was tried in the middle of the slowdown. And the attorneys who tried that case were prevailed uh, in the face of a, of a very big potential loss. And yet, when that case came down, what should have been a major victory uh, seemed to almost disappoint the section chief and his second in charge. The other thing I saw during the slowdown was a staggering drop in morale, based in part on the feelings of futility and downright absurdity in the face of the ever-increasing death toll. And more so, morale continued to plummet as employees from all parts of DEA, not just attorneys, began switching sides. I understand the idea behind this revolving door, but for me, there was nothing but confusion when the very special agent who referred to distributors and manufacturers as evil and the bad guys happily took a position uh, employed with one of those bad guys two weeks after retirement. Well, while DEA attorneys feared that a bad decision in federal court might strip DEA, DEA of the ISO, Congress effectively legislated the ISO away, ostensibly in the name of ensuring patient access to opioid-controlled substances. Without the ISO and its tool belt, DEA will likely have very little effect in forcing regulations against manufacturers, distributors, and large pharmacy chains. Um, ensuring patient access is a misleading description, painting the picture of an altruistic industry only concerned with saving lives. And while we may now consider corporations to be people, I have never seen an altruistic corporation. Um, I've gone a bit over, and so I apologize, but I thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Novak. We've had um, Heidi Heidkamp, Senator Heidkamp, join us. Senator Heidkamp, would you like to make any opening, uh, any opening comments before we begin questions? No, that's okay. Um, in this forthcoming law review article, you have an administrative, chief administrative law judge who is very familiar with this area of the law. Uh, he has written an article that will be published talking about this law and its impact on enforcement of um, the distribution of a deadly controlled sub a substance in ways that are irresponsible. Uh, I uh, ask him to join us today. I think his legal perspective, since we're talking about the law and how to uh, hopefully restore in the law some of the tools the DEA needs, would have been very helpful. I was bitterly disappointed that the DEA refused to allow him to come. And I want to put that on the record up front because to me that shows a lack of good faith. What is the DEA afraid of? This article is going to be published. It's going to be in the public record. Why not allow this judge to share his expertise with the men and women who are tasked under our Constitution of writing the law? So I, I want to say I um, have written and I have criticized uh, the DEA for refusing to allow him to come to this 
roundtable today, I uh, would like some kind of answer from the DEA as to what their rationale is for not allowing this judge to speak to what he obviously has written and will be published for the public. I will certainly go out of my way to give that article the attention it deserves. I will try to elevate it. I will try to uh, spread it across this country so more people understand what this issue is. I think, honestly, what happened with the change in this law was that many of us um, were not aware, as fully aware as we should have been, what these changes meant. And part of that was, of course, once the green light occurred from DEA, there was an assumption. I worked with DEA many years as a prosecutor. I would assume, as a prosecutor, the DEA I knew, that if the DEA gave the green light to legislation, it was not going to hamper enforcement. Uh, so I think that was a problem, that they did green light it. And I'm going to give you guys a chance to talk about that. Let me start with his assessment of the law. He said that if it had been the intent of Congress to eliminate DEA's ability to impose an immediate suspension on distributors or manufacturers, it would be difficult to conceive of a more effective vehicle for achieving that goal. Um, do you all, would you all speak to that? Do you agree with that assessment? Uh, did, was this the most effective way possible of removing the ISO as, as a tool that you could use? I, I guess I'll start. Yes, absolutely. Uh, first of all, Judge Mulrooney is one of the most brilliant judges I've ever met, and that's his second article. He wrote a, a, his initial article on uh, diversion uh, cases in administrative court several years mm -hmm. ago, and that, that article is used by any practitioner, a lot of practitioners in, in administrative court. And he's absolutely right. that uh, I, I don't see any other way of taking that authority away from us other than through the legislation. And he's right. The way it happened, uh, it just, all the pieces fell into place and, and we just, we lost, the, we lost the authority. We lost our ability to go after these people and we lost a very important deterrent effect that we had in our arsenal, so. Do, do, you, do, do Mr. Yonker, you and Mr. Novak agree that this was essentially removing one of the most important tools you had for inappropriate distribution of opioids? Uh, yes, ma'am, uh, and I can speak to uh, my part as a supervisor and to the individuals that I supervised in the Cincinnati office and to my colleagues that I still keep in contact with. Uh, this bill basically tore the heart out of the diversion program, and not only did it do that, it took the morale from those investigators and basically put it at a new low because they felt there was no backing and there was, there was nothing they could do. They, their hands were tied. Um, it, it was almost put, put to me like, and, and I can go back to your uh, prosecutorial days, Senator McCaskill, that uh, you didn't have the backing of the police officers you, you know, and the detectives uh, in, in, in your section, so why should they go out and bother to do anything? Right. That's basically how they looked at it. And right. this, this legislation, as, uh, as Mr. Rand has easy mentioned, for 45 years, there was never really an issue in, in any of this until all of a sudden, you know, the monetary issue started to come along, and that's when the problem started. You agree, Mr. Novak? Thank you, Senator. Um, yes. Um, I found that uh, the only time that we could get really any of the pharmacies or higher up the drug food chain to listen was when we shut them down. We reserved that tool. We only used it in, in the most extreme, most dangerous situations. Um, it's not like we were running around throwing it at everything, but to take it away this way, there's no, there's no teeth. There's, there's nothing that DEA can do to shut down. To, 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 to halt the sales, to halt the distributions, and as, as we've each said already, it seems like the only time that any of the distributors and manufacturers wants to listen is when it's hurting their bottom line. If we can't stop them, we can't affect their bottom line. They're, they have no reason to listen, not just for goodwill. Uh, we've had um, some other senators join us. I'll turn to 
Uh, Senator Hassan for questions, but let me introduce Senator Klobuchar, who's here from Minnesota, and Senator Hassan's colleague from New Hampshire, Senator Shaheen. Um, I'll, uh, it, it, if either one of you want to make a brief couple of comments before Senator Sh Hassan begins questioning. Sure, I just want to thank you, Senator McCaskill, for shedding light on this. And uh, we've just seen this um, abuse of power, basically, um, um, from the pharmaceutical industry uh, when it comes to this issue. And to think that we were taking away the very tools that were used, being used to save people's lives is outrageous. And that's why I join you on your bill. And thank you for bringing um, these experts together today. Well, I would echo the thanks to you for holding this hearing and to each of you on the panel for joining us today and for your work at DEA. Um, New Hampshire, as some of you may know, and Senator Hassan has probably already said, has the second highest overdose rate in the country, uh, the highest when it comes to fentanyl overdoses. And we have been very hard hit, and anything that we can do to try and address this is really critical, and making sure that DEA and other law enforcement agencies have the tools they need in order to shut down people who are pushing opioids is very important. So I look forward to working with my colleagues here to repeal the legislation that I think none of us understood what the impact was when it passed. So thank you. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Well, again, thank you all for being here. Um, I wanted to have us take a step back and just start with a question really ab about why we are here. And uh, I'll start with you, uh, Mr. Renazisi. Um, in your own words, can you help the public understand why it is so critical that the DEA have the power to shut down pill mills, problematic distribution centers, and other bad actors? How does that power help keep the public safe? In the cases that we use the ISO, Generally, millions and millions of tablets were floating downstream and being diverted into the illicit marketplace. So it would work this way. You'd have a pharmacy that uh, is filling prescriptions for rogue pain clinics. That pharmacy, the pharmacist in charge is not doing his job. That is looking at red flags presented with the prescriptions and determining if those prescriptions are legitimate. So he's ordering a ridiculous amount of drugs. And it might start off with 10,000 tablets of Oxy, 15 or 30 a month. And six months later, he's at 80 or 100,000 a month. Now, that's a suspicious order. That should set off bells and whistles to a distributor. But that distributor is just continuing to send drugs downstream. And he's not doing it just to that pharmacy. He's doing it to multiple pharmacies. Well, that pharmacist is basically filling prescriptions for drug seekers, drug abusers. So all of those drugs are going in to the illicit marketplace. And a lot of our drug seekers would take half of the drugs for themselves and sell the other half. Now an Oxy-30 tablet on the street is between $30 and $40 a tablet. So he's going to make enough money to go back to the same doctor and do the same thing. It's a cycle. Everybody in the controlled, every controlled substance registrant in the controlled substance infrastructure has a responsibility to do something, okay? And everybody, if they complied with their responsibilities, we wouldn't have this problem. And that's why it's so important. Thank you. Um, Mr. Novak, I wanted to turn to a piece of your testimony. I am particularly concerned with understanding why the DEA has seemed so reluctant to take on these powerful pharmaceutical industry players for the past several years. And I was struck in your testimony by your discussion of the revolving door between the DEA and industry. In particular, I was concerned to hear that you think the revolving door, and I think this is a quote from your written testimony, caused much of the slowdown in DEA enforcement actions that we've seen in recent years. Can you please expand on what you mean by that a bit? How do you think the revolving door caused that slowdown? In my experience, um, I can't speak to exerted pressures. Uh, there's higher level things going on at DEA that I was not a party to. I was a line attorney. I also know, though, that when I started, um, it was very rare to see a, a, my section was CCD. It was very rare to see a CCD attorney go and work for industry. We often had cases where the attorney was local or they had done FDA work and perhaps that was similar enough. 
Um, we knew our case law, we knew our statutes, we, we could essentially run circles around people. We, we were very good at what we did. Um, sorry, I was very proud of the work. But um, what I believe is that, uh, you know, there's a lot of speculation I can't speak to. I know very clearly that when you have someone who knows this work in and out go to the other side, now there's a real fear that we might lose. And what's the consequence of losing? Now, I don't know if that was the only idea, but the revolving door, we were afraid of losing, work was slowing down, so more and more people were leaving. And when you're leaving, you know, 99% of my colleagues, if they left, they were either going to a different part of the government or they were going into private practice. Well, if you've got five, 10, 15 years of DEA work under your belt, and now the distributors and manufacturers are being targeted more and more, they're looking to hire people on. Well, I, I thank you for that testimony. I find the whole issue of the revolving door very concerning, and that's why I joined a bill that Senator Tammy Baldwin has put in that make, would make it harder for former pharmaceutical regulators to go and lobby for pharmaceutical companies. The bill lengthens the amount of time that former regulators are banned from lobbying from one to two years and expands the definition of lobbying to include more of what they do. Do you think those changes would be helpful and what more do you think we need to do? I do think that they would be helpful. Mm -hmm. I, I, I absolutely do. Um, I think this is something we need to examine even more. Uh, there's certainly... I'm, I certainly believe that when people enter government service, they're, they're answering a calling. Yeah. I, I, I truly believe that. They may get disgruntled, they may get disillusioned, or they may have entered into government service to further a career down the line. And I, I, I don't know the degree to which, you know, there has to be a clear delineation between someone being able to go and work in a private industry and be rewarded for the hard work that they've done versus someone taking industry knowledge and using it against the very industry in ways that would seem unfair. Now, I can't say that any of that happened here, but in terms of what you're proposing, I think that it needs to be absolutely examined. It, it, it seems that a lot of what happened was a result of people with really good ideas and really good understanding being able to represent the other side now. Well, thank you, and, and thank you, Madam Chair, for letting me go over. Yeah, my pleasure. My first question, thanks, Madam Chair. My first question is, uh, uh, can you name today the uh, person from Missouri who became, was a failed haberdasher, later uh, served as U.S. Senator, served as Vice President, and then as President of the United States? Can you name that person? Yeah. Uh, who wants to name that person? Go ahead. Huh? You guys don't know this? Okay, Truman. Truman was Truman. not heavily involved in drug trafficking. <laughs> not their area of expertise, he was not. right, guys? But, can, but I'm uh, sure so, we had since you guys don't know the, the answer was Truman, I probably won't ask you to tell me something famous that he once said or something that might be appropriate for today, but here's what he used to say. He used to say, among other things, uh, the only thing new in the world is the history we forgot or never learned. The only thing new in the world is the history we forgot or never learned. I always like to, to look to see uh, what works, do more of that, see what we can learn from what's been tried before. And so my question is sort of in that, uh, that vein. Uh, Y'all bring a, uh, a lot of experience to, uh, uh, from years of uh, service at DEA. We thank you for, for that. What can you tell us? What can you tell us from your experience in terms of what, uh, what is working, what uh, needs to be uh, improved, and where our focus uh, needs to be moving forward for combating the opioid epidemic. That's my question. And uh, a gentleman with a lot of vowels in his name, Joseph, why don't you go first? Let's pronounce your last name for me. Ranazizi. Of course. I, I think we could start by, I, I don't want to lose sight of the fact that while we have a horrible fentanyl and der fentanyl derivative problem in the United States and heroin problem, we wouldn't have that problem if we had control of our pharmaceuticals. And 
I'm hearing this more and more now. Everybody's saying it's turning into a heroin problem or we have a heroin and fentanyl problem. I've even heard people say pharmaceuticals are not the problem anymore. It's heroin and fentanyl. We wouldn't be there if we didn't have a pharmaceutical problem. Our opioid problem, we have an insatiable appetite for pharmaceutical opioids. It's just that they price themselves out. It, you can't afford buying six or seven Oxy-30 tablets when you could just buy a couple of $10 bags of heroin, and that's what's happening up in New England now. So as we move forward, and we don't want to lose track or sight of what happened historically, we need to handle the pharmaceuticals, which means we continue we need to continue to apply regulatory pressure. We need the doctors and the pharmacists to be trained better, understanding what to look for. We need better treatment throughout the country. You, if, you're, if you're in a rural area in Appalachia, the chances of you getting treatment, even as a 14 or 15 or 16-year-old, is slim to none. And we just don't have that. Don't lose sight of the fact that pharmaceuticals started that. There was an article by, uh, a medical article by Jones, Chris Jones, uh, I think it was about four years ago. And what Jones said was between 75 and 80% of the people that were treated for heroin started with pharmaceuticals. Okay, I'm gonna ask you to hold it right there, Mr. Yonker, Mr. Novak, same question. What can you tell us from your experience in terms of what is working, maybe what needs to be improved? where our focus needs to be moving forward in combating the opioid uh, epidemic. Please, Mr. Yonker, just briefly. Senator, for 30 years I've lived this problem, and I think you have 600 dedicated diversion investigators, give or take, in, in that section of the Drug Enforcement Administration, and they all raised their right hands when they got hired but yet right now it seems that there doesn't seem to be any backing from anybody for that particular program. You have what's been labeled now an epidemic, but this epidemic, I've lived it for 30 years and Mr. Ranazizi has as well too. It's been ongoing and Mr. Ranazizi is, is correct. The fentanyl and heroin that's out there now is a direct result of not stemming and stopping the pharmaceutical issue. They're, they're all tied in hand to hand. Secondly, there's no one here to run the Drug Enforcement Administration. If you have an epidemic or a crisis, you wanna have a leader. Right now, there is nobody in charge of that program that's gonna be able to step forward, answer the questions, take the lead and take the helm to do what's, what's right. Thirdly, I'm, I'm going to ask you to hold it there because I don't have that much more time. Let me just say I could strongly agree with your second point. Leadership, most important ingredient in the success of any organization, large or small, government or not. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Mr. Novak, thanks very much. Mr. Yonker. Uh, in terms of what's working and what has been working, I, I, I agree with, uh, with, with Mr. Renazizi uh, that enforcement actions, when we were able to enforce, the numbers were up. And we were creating, it's not just about stopping the individuals, it's about showing that we're out there doing that. Someone's gonna second guess this potential bad decision if they think they might get in trouble, but if they think they're just gonna get away with it, they won't do anything. They're just gonna go ahead and make the wrong choice. In terms of what needs improvement, I, I found in my time at DEA that there's a real animosity between our registrants and DEA. There's a real conflict that there's, no, there's not good communication. And they come in defensive. They don't want to report suspicious orders. They don't want to discuss what they did or didn't do correctly. They don't want to go out and do their due diligence um, when it comes to uh, numbers rising strikingly at a pharmacy. They don't want to do this until they're in the crosshairs and about to get in trouble. Uh, and that being said, I think that the environment never bolstered good communication because they were given multiple chances to correct, they didn't correct, and now you've got an angry DEA who is tired of giving you chances. I think that there needs to be a step back and I think that there needs to be a real discussion of what kind of communication and what kind of information needs to be passed so that there's a better understanding of what's expected. All right, th my thanks to each of you, thanks so much. Thank you, uh, Senator Heitkamp. Thank you. Um, you know, what we're talking about is the genie went out of the box, right? So all of a sudden, you have 
um, overprescription of opioids, you have this normalization of, of um, utilization, which then leads to addiction, which then leads to illicit drug use, whether it's fentanyl or heroin. But at the heart of it is, can we now fix it? And, and I, I'm just going to draw an analogy, and I don't mean to, to give an, a comparison, but an analogy. You think about tobacco usage, right? So for years we tolerated it even though we knew that it was in fact addictive and that it was in fact a killer. And then we did some things where we started, well, you can't really smoke here, and then you can't do this, and you can't do that. But we also went to the convenience stores and the people who sold tobacco, and we said, put it behind the counter. Because this is true, they used to put it by the door so kids would shoplift it. They did. They used to put it by the door because when they came in and placed it, kids would shoplift it, and that was just one more person you could get addicted. Right? So, so now we're in this process of saying, what do we do to step back and fix this problem? And we know we've taken action, whether it's pain management in hospitals where we want to get a 10 smiley face, or whether it is, in fact, bulk distribution. You know, we, we've taken action that have exacerbated the problem. So, so we're trying to roll that back, and I think Senator McCaskill has done a great job getting on top of, of this provision, but it's not the only thing we should be doing. We need to be looking at what other things we can do, but I do know this as a former uh, drug enforcement, I, I headed up the task forces in North Dakota that did drug enforcement. If we don't have an active, aggressive, and very ever-present drug enforcement effort, in this country, it'll get cheaper and it will get used more. And so when people say we can't, we can't legislate our way out of this problem, we can't, we can't um, uh, incarcerate our way out of this problem, in no way should we ever believe that we shouldn't, as part of the solution, amp up dollars for enforcement. And so um, I wanna ask, when you look at this and you say what's the optimum amount of enforcement, federal enforcement effort, and how can we um, collaborate locally with other state enforcement agencies to actually change outcomes? What would you tell me um, at your experience, I guess? Mr. Novak, let's start with you. What, what more do we need to do in terms of drug enforcement um, to solve this problem? It's a very simple question, thank you. Um, it, it, this, I want to start with this. When I was per, uh, prosecuting these cases, uh, I once worked, an ex worked with an expert in pain management, and he explained, and he would explain this on the stand. It was, it was brilliant. And he would talk about how pain management is a multidisciplinary program. You can't just provide someone with opioids and then they live on opioids the rest of their life. It's not designed for long-term use. What he said is you needed to maybe try out opioids, but also physical therapy, mental therapy you know, go into a lot of different things so that you can treat what the real problem is. Here we're talking about, you know, I, I wanna be able to just say as much enforcement as possible. Yes, but also we need to be reaching out um, to the states who are bearing the burden of the loss of human life and the cost associated with this. And we need to be going to local law enforcement and saying, let's team up. We need to be looking into um, treatment programs. The old treatment programs don't work anymore. This is a different beast, and people are addicted for life. We need to educate children that mommy's medicine cabinet is a dangerous place. We need, we need this on all fronts. We have to do what they did in the tobacco with, 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 with smoking. We need to change how America thinks about this. We need to start on a very small level, but we need to work everywhere. And you know, it's education, it's treatment, but it's a lot of law enforcement because again, if you don't have a big push for law enforcement on this, then you don't have people recognizing whether they're doing it for a good reason or not that this is the wrong thing to yeah. do. I think one of the challenges that we have is when you look at tobacco or you look at domestic violence programs, we all know what best practices are. You know, it's, it's almost CDC has come up with a formula for tobacco control. It's resulted in probably the, one of the greatest public health um, successes in the history of our country. We don't have time to examine and experiment on best practices. And, and to my point, we desperately need to have leadership, 
and multidisciplinary activity, but we can't do it without a robust, aggressive, and very ever-present um, uh, drug enforcement effort. And so uh, thank you all for coming and thank you for caring about our children and caring about our communities. It makes a huge difference. And, and this is a public health crisis that, um, as you've said, knows no income, knows no partisan bent. It is, uh, knows no part of the region or the country. And, and we're all in this together. Senator Shaheen. Thank you, Madam Chair. And Mr. Renazizi, um, you pointed out that people often start on opioids and then they switch to heroin. I remember very clearly where I was when I heard from a medical doctor in the Lakes region of New Hampshire who said that to me. This was a couple of years ago. He said, people start out on opioids and then when they can't get them anymore, um, they switch to heroin because it's easier and cheaper. And in that community, you could buy a bag of heroin for about $7 two years ago. Um, and as all of you have pointed out, there are a lot of responses that we need to be making as a society to this epidemic. But in addition to repealing this current law that we're talking about, what else does DEA need? Obviously, leadership is one of those things, but are there other tools that Congress could, should be looking at in terms of providing support, resources to DEA to be able to do your jobs? I'll ask you first, and then if somebody else wants to um, add. Getting our authority back, or getting DEA's authority back under uh, ISO is important. But I, I, let me twist that around a second. What uh, Mr. Novak said is absolutely correct. Uh, we should be working more with the states. And, and we do. We have tactical diversion squads in 66 areas of the country, and we work very closely with the states. But the states are the ones that are out there doing the day-to-day -day inspections of pharmacies, clinics, hospitals. My suggestion is that they're afforded the same opportunity to, in, to review transactional data that DEA does. The, we, DEA has a system called ARCOS, the Automation of Reports and Consolidated Order System that, conduct, that, that looks at every transaction on Schedule Two and Three narcotics in the United States. We know what's going from manufacturers to distributors right down to pharmacies. Shouldn't pharmacy boards have that same data? It, Absolutely, and Congress should have it too. And my recollection is when we tried to get it, it's been very difficult. Under your oversight authority, I'm pretty sure you you should have access to that data. Um, but why, I don't understand why we're hiding that data from the states that are doing day-to-day -day operations in these pharmacies. If a state has a minimal number of uh, investigators, don't you want them to go out to, into the pharmacies that have the, the, the largest volume to see why they have such a large volume? Well, the only way to do that is to have Arcos data. And the only way to get Arcos data is if DEA gives it to you, because under 827, only the AG is supposed to have it. So why not change it? I agree. That makes perfect sense. I think the more transparent we are, the better. I remember a, the father, a father who lost his daughter to an overdose telling me that when she was going through um, her substance misuse that they were ashamed to say anything to anybody and um, that what they... He learned is that we need to talk about it. We need to make sure people understand what's going on. And I think that's true of people who, who have substance use disorders, but it's also true of how we respond to it, making things as transparent as possible. Let me ask you, Mr. Novak, um, one of the things that is beginning to happen is that states are looking at suing pharmaceutical companies. New Hampshire is one of those states that's joined in a large lawsuit. Um, can you talk about how important you think that is in trying to change the behavior of pharmaceutical companies? It's, it's come up already today. I think there's a very clear comparison, though it's not identical, to the tobacco litigation. Right. And we live in a world now where smoking, you're ostracized as a smoker in America today. That's not how it was even when I was growing up. We used to smoke in the mall and smoke at McDonald's. It was, and just to think of how different that is, how children look at smoking as disgusting, not to 
just saying it's a different thing. We taught the dangers of smoking. That's what these state litigations are going to do. States and counties are able to go out and they're able to put together these cases and honestly ask for compensation for the damages done. And I think that's where this all starts. I think that that's where we start to see change and that's where we start to see funding for that change. Um, I've been very excited to see that happening. Um, it's, it's a big wave right now. Um, I certainly agree with that. Let me ask though also, I think um, many pharmaceutical companies have um, tried to put out a medication that they think is genuinely gonna help people and certainly there are uses for opioids that are um, very important medical uses and we shouldn't discount those. But shouldn't we also ask those same pharmaceutical companies to bear some responsibility, as you say, and without being sued, ask them to come forward and help us as we're looking at research that we need to do to come up with uh, a non-addictive um, painkiller to help us as we look at treatment and new ways of treating people who have um, substance use disorders. Don't you think that also is something that we ought to be asking the pharmaceutical companies to do? I absolutely agree, and, and it's, again, to make the comparison, it was the tobacco companies, they're paying for the anti-smoking ads. Right. Um, that being said, I think that, as I said earlier, I, I'm too young to be cynical, but I really don't believe in an altruistic corporation, and I don't believe that without this sort of litigation or pressure that any of these corporations are going to willingly reach out. But yes, they would be one of the prime sources to move forward with starting to make a change. Thank you, thank you all very thank much. You. Thank you, Senator Markey, for being here. Thank you, and thank you for uh, calling us, Senator McCaskill. This is just so important. Um, we're now deep into this entire storyline. We know there's an epidemic. We actually know what has to happen. Uh, we know where the culpability lies. Um, the president keeps saying that he wants to do something about this, but he still hasn't put out a recommendation for the amount of money that he wants to spend on it, and we all know that a vision without funding is an hallucination, right? So, so we're, we're still stuck without a, a president who is willing to actually say what he means um, in terms of the amount of funding. And so words without deeds are actually meaningless, okay? So the, the issues that you're dealing with are uh, at the center of the problem as well, and uh, I, I, uh, I've introduced a bill, the Opioid Quota Act, which would require the DEA to make public the procurement quotas it issues to drug manufacturers and thereby allow the public and other federal agencies to know which companies are making these opioids, the quantity of them. And in light of the ongoing crisis, uh, I believe that it is absolutely imperative that this information is just publicly available so that we can see who is doing what, and have them have to justify the number which they are producing each year. Uh, do you agree that these numbers should be made public, uh, Mr. Novak? I, I absolutely agree. I think that transparency of this kind of information is important. I think that, you know, it, it should, these, there are a lot of things that perhaps shouldn't be out there, but this kind of thing, exactly, this is what we need to know. We need to know who's doing this, uh, and, and, and they need to be able to be held accountable. And a lot of the work between industry and, and DEA in terms of the regulations is behind a curtain. The public has no idea. Right. And I think that it would benefit people to have more access to them. So the DEA should release these numbers, right? I would think so. Good. Uh, Mr. Yonker. Senator Markey, thank you. Uh, I believe they should go to Congress. I'm not so sure whether the public would necessarily need to know that. Um, it could be up to Congress to release that if they should so choose, because there's a lot of different ways, numbers and things could be construed. Um, so I'm not so sure that it should be just blanketly put out there for everybody, but that's just my opinion for right now. But, but, but I, I could be dissuaded one way or the other, but right now my, my initial thought is it could be released 
to members of Congress, but I don't know if it should just be blanketly put out there for, you know, for, for everybody just because, you know, numbers could say a lot of different, different things to a lot of different people. Right. But the one thing we would want to see is it's going down and down and down yes, and down. Yes, that's, that's and, correct, you know, yes. So that everyone understands it. Right now, it's behind a curtain. So you got to get it out in front because, you know, the public um, is um, in need of the facts so that they can build their own army because there's an army of lobbyists up here. Yes, well, all these that's companies, correct. you know, that it, that works to keep it behind the curtain. So if you put it out in public, there's one thing is for sure that all the problems will be identified very quickly by the public, you know, because the public doesn't trust the experts anymore. Okay? The experts were all saying, oh, they couldn't handle it. Oh, it would be so hard for them to interpret this correctly. You know, the, we are experts. You really don't have to. Uh, you know, have all this information. It'll just get too confusing for you, right? But the truth is, the more people learn about this, the more they realize that the experts let them down. The physicians, the pharmaceutical companies, all the way down the line, right? It took the police and the fire departments to start talking to members of Congress because of all their visits. It wasn't, quote, unquote, the medical experts who did it. Mr. Ranazizi, do you think these numbers should be made public? Yes, I do. Uh, quote, is, quote is highly technical, but what I could tell you, and one day I'd love to sit down and tell you what the problem with the quota laws are. Uh, the, the quotas will naturally decrease when prescribing decreases, okay? Because all quota is based upon is the number of prescriptions, the number of disposals, and DEA has very little leeway in changing the quota. But I would love to sit down and tell you because there's several issues in quota that could be changed and corrected. Good. I would love to talk to you. That would be very helpful. So and I'll ask you the related question, which is the lack of mandatory medical education for physicians, for nurse practitioners, for anyone who distributes these drugs. Do you all believe that there should be mandatory national education for anyone who prescribes opioids to the American public? Mr. Novak. Sorry, it was very heavily nodding here, I think that absolutely. The problem with a lot of what's happened with this, this epidemic is that the only instructions that any physician has for how to properly use the medication is coming from the manufacturer. Right. Uh, that's, that's, not, that's not a test, that's not objective, and we, the public, believe in our doctors. And I don't believe that the, every doctor out there who's prescribing opioids is a bad doctor who's trying to make a right. buck. Some of them are well-meaning. Uh, they really are, but the only guidance they have is what's on the back of the bottle, and they aren't educated on it, but we, the public, don't know that. Right, we but what's, and what's on the back of the bottle is what the manufacturer puts exactly. on the back of the bottle who wants to keep up their quotas. Exactly. They don't want the quotas to go down. Yep. They make money the higher it is. So do you agree that mandatory education Mr. Yonker? Yes, Senator Markey, I most yeah. certainly do. Beautiful. If you go back to a physician who has eight years of training and go and, you know, goes through you know, all the processes, you can probably put your fingers together very tightly to see how much controlled substance training they actually get. And that doesn't bode them very well when they get out into the real world to, to, right. to do that. My, so my, I wife, agree 100%. my wife was a physician. She said it was never mentioned in medical school. So. And uh, Mr. Renazizi. Absolutely. And I think ONDCP and DEA and FDA have been looking at uh, working with physicians to create a program uh, that will satisfy that. And also, just remember, there's a lot of physicians that were trained in the 80s and early 90s under this idea that opioids are not as dangerous as they want, we once thought they were, and the rate of addiction is very low. And it's unfortunate, but there's still doctors out there who believe that because that's how they were trained. No, it's sad. Uh, thank you all so much for your leadership. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, so I'm trying to get at this. You all have a perspective that is unique in that you were on the front lines of trying to monitor where these pills were going and what quantities. Uh, it, who knows where these pills are going and in what quantities? The DEA? Yes, in Arcos, we could tell you exactly what quantities of drugs are going downstream. Unfortunately, we have, the Arcos system is generally around four to six months behind. Okay. So four to six months after the bills have already hit the marketplace, you can see that there was a problem that, let's say, um, 
9 million pills going into a community that is a very small community. Yes, that's why we rely on suspicious order monitoring. So then you know four to six months after, who else knows when these pills are going in quantities to certain locations that would make them inherently suspicious? The drug companies. The manufacturers? Uh, potentially, yeah. They have surveillance systems that look at what drugs are going downstream. Are they required to have surveillance systems that, that, that show where the drugs are going downstream? A manufacturer is held to the same standards that a distributor is because a coincidental activity to manufacturing is distribution. So they're held to the same standards. They have to know their customers. They have to do due diligence and file suspicious orders when, necessary, when, when found. So right now, let's say you're one of the big three distributors. What is your obligation under the law to tell the DEA that you are shipping too many drugs to a given locality based on the size of the population? Well, we've made, we've made industry aware of it's not just shipping and telling us. They have to do due diligence, and if they believe that that, if they believe that, that shipment is suspicious, they're to file a suspicious order and not ship that order. That's basically what we've told them since 2006, 7. Eight, I've sent two, memo, two letters to all registrants in 2007 and 2000, 2006 and 2007 stating that Southwood, uh, which was a, uh, a case we did, uh, basically buttressed those, the, those, those letters. And then Masters came in and buttressed Southwood and the letters. So these are Plus, cases that were actually tried to a decision, so there's court precedent, about the obligation of a distributor to not ship after they've done their due diligence if they determine the amounts that are being shipped would inherently make them suspicious. I, I think in Masters they basically, they didn't say not ship, but they said if it's a suspicious order, and I could be wrong, if, if it's a suspicious order, Okay, they must do due diligence and make a determination before they ship. They have to resolve, basically. And so do you believe that's going on right now? I, I, I think that in some cases it's not. I think some of the distributors are now attempting to follow their requirements under the Act and under the case precedent. But I'm sure there are distributors out there who are not doing that. Obviously, when you see 9 million tablets going into a, 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 a town that has yeah. 392 people. Um, I'm trying to figure out um, what it was about the ISOs that were so objectionable to the, man, to the distributors. Um, were they trying to say that they were arbitrary and capricious? I mean, if, if you all were doing an ISO, then you had pretty good data to back it up, or I'm assuming because you didn't use it all the time, that would indicate you were trying to stop the harm from occurring is once it ships, once it gets to that pharmacy that's filling it like that was described in Dent County, then it's too late. So I'm assuming they were thinking that you were being unfair and that's why they wanted to lobby to change this bill? I mean, what, what, I, what, what I is your think sense? My, my sense is that uh, when you start to hit them in the wallet, that gets their attention. I, I mean, an immediate suspension order is just such. They will cease and desist anything. Now, you can, it'll stop a doctor from prescribing. It'll stop a pharmacy from, from filling. and It'll stop a distributor from distributing. Immediately. And then they have their due process that they go through in order to, you know, and they have the remedies available to them to do that. So it's, it's, it's an immediate action to, to, to stop, uh, you know, the potential diversion that's based on, you know, what's outlined in the immediate, you know, suspension order. And in that instance, when you do that, you're obviously stopping revenue as well, too. Right. And it was challenged five times, you said, in 45 years, Mr.? Yeah, Mizzy? five times in 45 years. The, the principal case would have been Norman Bridge, but that case involved some really outrageous government conduct, so you really can't consider it. We'll freely admit that that case was DEA's fault. DEA's worst yeah, moment. It, it was, and we use that as the principal case to never, ever do what they did in that case. 
So obviously, it, the ISOs were not arbitrary and capricious in terms of you all inappropriately using them if they'd only been challenged five times in 45 years. I mean, that seems to me the data is pretty clear on its face that this was not a, a tool that was being overused, A, or B, using, used in a way that the courts would disapprove, correct? Yeah, I believe you're absolutely correct. Okay, so I want to understand this quota thing because I, you know, kind of got angry uh, because maybe I didn't understand how the quota was set. And I, you said you wanted to have a conversation about it. But he's gone. It's just us now. We can have a conversation to some extent. Um, you, the quotas that the DEA sets mm -hmm. are based on the prescribing level of the previous year, correct? Yes, the rate of disposal, and included in that is when the number. When you say rate of disposal, translate that to English. Disposal that sounds could be like anything. taking out the garbage. Amount of drugs that are amount of drugs that are sent downstream for prescribing. Okay. okay. Uh, the amount of drugs that are destroyed, the amount of inventory that's destroyed for any number of reasons, uh, bad batches, uh, the, the too long on the shelf, they got to get rid of it. Uh, the amount of returns. Uh, so the so. You look at that, and that's how you make that determination, but the largest amount would be the amount that's going into prescriptions. So, so if prescriptions go down, the quota is naturally going to go decrease. Down. Yes. But if prescriptions are continuing to rise, the quotas are going to rise. Yeah, so let's use an example. The DEA made their great, the statement that, oh, we reduced quota by 20% uh, two years ago. They really didn't. What happened was we had a a contingency plan in case there was a catastrophic event in the supply chain that would require us to issue quota immediately. So say what happened in Puerto Rico, say if we lost two major manufacturers in Puerto Rico and they lost all their raw material. At that point in time, we'd unlock that lockbox containing that 20% and reissue quota to them that's all that 20% was. What they did was take away 20% of nothing because we never deployed that 20%. Oh, I see. So essentially, they made the number smaller, but there was still a backup plan, which has already been there, but it was always included in the larger number in the past. Yeah, and they removed the 20%, which is the backup plan. Okay. So basically, there is no backup plan now. So you have to go through the administrative process, which means probably waiting 60 days in a catastrophic event to reissue quota. So the fact that quota raised was raised 300 percent between 2010 and 2016 is purely a reflection of the amount of drugs that were being manufactured and prescribed within the United States of America. Yes, and the amount. Yes, exactly. Not because the DEA was saying, "Okay, we're gonna it, we're gonna raise your rate, so then you can go out and try to find new ways to sell it." it one drove the other. The rate of prescription drove the increase in the quota. You're absolutely correct. And just so you know, 826 re, uh, prohibits DEA from, uh, from issuing quota based on a particular drug. A manufacturer could get quota based on their previous year's sales and their contracts uh, of raw material manufacturer. Once they get all that raw material, they could do whatever they want. They don't have to ship it to the contract holder. That they, they could sell it to somebody else. DEA has no ability to lock them into who they obtain the quota for, nor does DEA have the ability to tell them what drugs to make. So once the quota is issued, they could do whatever they want with their quota. I see. Senator Carper. Thank you, Senator McCaskill. Um, Senator okay. McCaskill, yeah. Senator McCaskill knows I... Uh, I, uh, I always, uh, oftentimes like to ask a panel just for advice, for us. And like, uh, what would you do if, if you're in, in, in our shoes? But just give us, uh, if you will, um, one or two actions that, uh, that the Congress needs to take uh, in order to address uh, more effectively the, the, this epidemic. And what specifically should we be considering when it, when it comes to making sure that law enforcement has the tools that it needs to, to address the uh, bad actors in the system. And uh, I'm going to start with Mr. Yonker, because I cut you short in the first time through, so you get the lead. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Carper. Um, I think it kind of goes back to your previous question and yes, Senator McCaskill's question as well, too. You have this bill, this law, the Ensuring Patient Access and Effective Drug Act. We all here seem to know this, this needs to go. Correct. Okay. In the absence of this, you can 
remove this bill, but as long as you still have someone that's an obstruction that's sitting at DEA, it's not going to matter. Okay. An obstructionist at what level? I'm sorry. It, the obstructionist in the form of the chief of CCD, Mr. Lee Reeves. Okay. Okay. And and so it's like, you know, uh, you have a prosecutor that lost the basically, you know, the respect of the people in the field, and yet that person still sits there. I have nothing personal against Mr. Reeves. I just know how the field is and, and what, and, and, and Mr. Novak can obviously shed a little bit more light since he worked in that particular section. But, you know, those two items need to happen simultaneously. Uh, and additionally, the last thing is um, every state in the union has a prescription drug monitoring program. Except uh, Missouri. Except Missouri. So they have sort of like a hybrid now of some Not sorts really. or another, whatever it is. It's, it, it, it was 10. <laughs> 10. Yeah, the counties are setting them up. Yeah, the, it, it, not the state. The counties, but there's nothing going on in a statewide Right, right. Mm -hmm. and that's an unfortunate that hopefully that can change. Um, believe me. <laughs> um, it would be nice if all the states could share their PDMP data. The what? Say it again. P it would be nice if all the states could share their PDMP data into a federal database so that everybody can take a look and see where everybody's going. You, know, you understand what I'm saying? In other words, you can, you, they submit the data. When you say everybody, state. who is everybody? I'm sorry. The law enforcement people, you know, the DEA and other law enforcement, they can access other people's PDMP data if they have okay. an investigation of some kind oh, okay. that, okay. that lends them to do that. Because right now the systems really don't talk to one another. You have 50 separate systems, 49, sorry. All right, good. Yeah. Mr. Novak's over there nodding his head. You wanna just jump in here, Mr. Novak? Sure, thank you. I, I, I will echo exactly what was just said. I think the very first thing that needs to happen here is we need to reinstate the ISO. We need to repeal this law. Um, I think that DEA needs to get back on its feet and start enforcing. I think that you, you should also be looking at how can DEA get more support to put together programs with the states for enforcement actions, to put together um, bigger enforcement actions like it was doing five years ago. I think that there needs to be a push. If we're going to treat this like an opioid epidemic, which I do believe it is, then we need to provide the resources to DEA to do this work. Um, and and I, I completely agree that we need to look at um, the way that the data that's compiled by states, that's compiled by DEA, and that's compiled by registrants, all speaks to different aspects of the same thing and could provide DEA with a much better picture of what things actually look like. Um, I think that if DEA has access to that kind of information more easily, and if the states uh, do as well to a certain degree, then enforcement actions become more clear cut. All right, thanks. Uh, last word, Giuseppe, also known as Joseph. Thank you, sir. I, getting to what Mr. Yonker said about the PDMPs, I, I'm, I'm really cautious about dealing with state PDMP data because it's HIPAA information, personal patient information. I do agree, though, that the states should all be interconnected. In fact, the National Association of Boards of Pharmacy has taken charge of, of connecting all of these states, and I think they have over 30 states connected now, maybe closer to 40 states connected, which is, is phenomenal. And, and I think that's really important uh, to, to assess and, and, and follow doctor shoppers and other bad doctors as they go from state to state. I, I think and my friends here have talked about uh, enforcement, I think we need more better treatment and education. Let's talk about education. We need education starting at the fourth grade level, third, fourth, and fifth grade level. If we're not educating these kids, when we're waiting till the high school level, we've lost them already. Uh, and as far as treatment, I've said this before and I'll say it again, if we don't treat these people, that these, these poor souls that are you know, really struggling with this, we're always gonna have this problem because it's just a cycle and we either lose them or they go to jail. We either lose them because they overdose and die or they go to jail and we need better treatment throughout the country. Mm -hmm. And that's it. All right, I just say as a, as a footnote, uh, the, the, the visits that I've made and the meetings I've had, 
uh, with folks in hospitals and other uh, centers in our state in Delaware. Um, they tell me that uh, the folks who are addicted uh, may show up in a, uh, an emergency room of a hospital, and maybe not for the first time, but maybe they get to a point in time where they're ready for treatment. And when they reach that point, and they hit the bottom, that we've got to be there to make sure that they get that treatment, they get it quickly, not let, uh, not waste that uh, that, oppor uh, that opportunity. So, thank you all. This is great. I'm happy to be a part of it. And thank you very much for pulling us together, Claire. Thank you, S Senator. Um, so, had you, Mr. Uh, Ranazisi, had you met with the CEOs or the upper echelon of these, the big three distributors? prior to you leaving the DEA to talk to them about their responsibilities in, in regards to uh, stopping these shipments before they go out to these uh, suspicious locations based on volume? I personally did not meet. However, my staff met with the big three back in 2006. All three of them came in. Uh, one at a time for face-to-face -face meetings where we explained what their obligations were under the law. At that point in time, we were dealing with the Internet. We showed them what a suspicious order is. We showed them why it was suspicious. We showed ordering patterns that showed that they were doing something that they probably shouldn't be doing. And then with that information, we gave them binders of information. We gave them their own Arcos reports. And with that information, we sent them back out and said, now you should have the tools. Then we, we also went to distributor conferences. We had our own distributor conferences. And every time we met, we told them what their obligations were under the law. I personally met with one company because I asked for their surrender. Uh, they chose not to surrender. And um, we moved forward with the administrative action. But other than that, uh, we met with them plenty of times. Explain what you explain what you asked for their surrender. What what does that mean? Okay, every per, every company that deals with controlled substances is a DEA registrant, so they have a registration to obtain, procure, and distribute controlled substances. This particular company uh, was. Uh, brought in, we showed them exactly what an internet pharmacy was, we showed them what to look for, we showed them what their obligations were under 1301.74, uh, suspicious order monitoring, and we sent them back out and instead of decreasing the amount of drugs going downstream to the specific pharmacies that we were looking at at the time, there was an increase in the amount of drugs. So when they came back in, I asked them why they did this, and they couldn't give me a response, and millions of drugs were going downstream, and so I just asked them to surrender their registration. They said, well, we're, we're, they were upset that we called them in there to ask for their registration and surrender, and I explained to them that we're going to move forward with administrative action, which we did. And what happened? Uh, we took away, uh, we suspended their, their registrations in certain facilities, and um, after they signed an MOA, a memorandum of agreement, and uh, uh, they got their registrations back in a period of time afterwards, and they started their business again. And did they go back to doing the same pattern of business again, or did they improve after that? No, actually... Uh, Three years later, they pretty much did the same thing, same violation, suspicious order monitoring. They chose, uh, they, they basically... And which um, company is this? Um, that would have been McKesson. So you go to McKesson and you say, look, you are filling these orders at internet pharmacies that are um, not appropriate. This is absolutely wrong. These are not legitimate pharmacies. You need to stop and you went through the process of having to pull their registration to be able to distribute controlled substances. They then agreed after you did that to, to, to the terms that you set out, and then they started doing the same thing again? Only this time it wasn't internet pharmacies. This time it was pain uh, clinics that were filling opioid medication for, uh, for rogue pain clinics, pharmacies that were... Pill mills. Yeah, pill mills. 
And how long after, and then did you go after them again for the pill mills? Well, that was the most recent case. So that would have been the case where they uh, paid $150 million in fines. And where in this time frame did the impetus for getting this bill passed that took away ISOs occur? Was it bef after the first time you pulled their registration, or was it mm -hmm. after the second time when you went after them on the pill mill? I think it was after we went, it, I think it was when we went after Cardinal the second time. Uh, that's when we started actually getting a little pushback. Okay. Um, the Haidas, when I was a prosecutor, we had a Haida uh, because we had a huge meth issue in Missouri that we were needing to work across county lines because the cooks, I used to tease the DAs from Manhattan. I said, you don't have a meth problem in Manhattan because you all are the kind of folks, you don't share recipes. But in the Midwest, we shared the recipe a lot. And so we had a lot of meth cooks. And when they were moving across county lines, it was hard to track them, hard to catch them. This was when there was a lot of self-manufacturing going on. There wasn't that much coming from Mexico at the time. And the Haidas were really effective in terms of beginning to integrate, which is one of the biggest challenges in law enforcement, as you guys well know, is the integration of local and federal. Um, I'm sure you've got stories to tell. Uh, I've got some stories to tell. My stories are that the locals were always right and you guys were always wrong. I'm sure your stories would be you were always right and the locals didn't know what they were doing. But the point is that the Haidas were really the only place I saw a really good integration of federal and local working together on a problem that was bigger than one community. It strikes me that opioids is the same thing. Do you believe the Haida organization is still valid? Do you think it's being utilized appropriately as it relates to the opioid crisis in this country? I'm not so sure if, if, if Haida is the, the right way to go. Um, I think when you're dealing with doctors, pharmacists, manufacturers, distributors, those are very specialized types of investigations. And the diversion people in DEA get that specialized training, okay, down at Quantico. And they go through 14, 15 weeks, and that's all they do. Uh, a lot of the state and local people don't understand how to conduct those types of investigations, don't understand the nuances of manufacturers and distributors and what all goes into, into that. So uh, I think in terms of maybe the street dealers, that's, that's one thing. But in terms of those specialized types of investigations, because these are drugs that are legitimate in the right. sense, it's not you know heroin or cocaine, and we're right. you know it's in there. So there, there's a lot more that has These to go. These are not in. street drugs, right? So you have to do a lot more, right. and, and then then you know prove a lot of different things. And a lot of times, it's expert witnesses and a lot of different things, depending on you know how your case goes. So so when a local police officer knows that there is a, 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 a pill mill, uh, I mean they know who the, the folks are in their community that are using and pushing. Right. Um, they know where they're going. They know the pharmacies that are looking the other way. Are they communicating effectively with DEA at this point to bring in the diversion expertise? I would probably think in some, I guess it just depends on, on the relationship that they have within the community. Now, my prior background is in, in law enforcement before I came on to DEA. And I always relied on the state and local people when I did my cases because they were the ones who were able to get the local people because they know their community and those actors. And then from there, you could build your case moving up, you know, up, up the stream. So I always try to get my state and local people involved as well too, because it is their community. They know the people and we had some of the expertise and, and most of them that I dealt with uh, always relished the fact and like, you know, that we were helping them out as well too. So it, it just depends, I guess, on the work and relationship that, that each office has with, with that and, and how, whether somebody wants to actually actively go out and, and ask for the locals' help, if that's the case. Um, it, it, since the law was changed, by the way, we've not been able so far to find a single Republican to co-sponsor this legislation, which is really disappointing to me. I'm, keep, I'm, I'm, I'm working at it. Usually I don't have trouble getting bipartisan support for bills. 
Um, I work on a lot of bills on a bipartisan basis. I'm, on, I'm asked to be on just as many bills by Republicans as, frankly, I ask Republicans to be on my bills. I've been confused as to why Republicans are reluctant to go on this piece of legislation to reverse this and put it back so that DEA has this tool. Um, since the law was changed, have there been any of these? Um, uh, now they, have, they get to submit a corrective action plan before any action is taken. Have, have there been any of those? Do you know whether there have been any corrective action plans that have been filed, any action? Has this new statute been helpful in any way in terms of stopping the inappropriate distribution of opioids in this country? I'm, I'm not familiar with it having come up yet. Um, I would say, though, that it's very stargazy to think that it's going to be effective in terms of the way I, I've been talking about it is, in my experience, the distributors and manufacturers and, and, and all registrants knew what they were doing. We've now given them an opportunity to correct that without them getting in trouble. But they already know. That, they already knew that, they that, weren't doing what they were supposed to be doing, I fully, obviously. Absolutely. And I fully believe that those corrective plans are already drafted. So the minute that DEA goes after one of the larger companies, they've got it in their back pocket, ready to go. They're not correcting their behavior. They well, let's already ask know. for that. In our, we're doing an investigation right now to the manufacturers and the, dist, the distributors, and we've asked for a lot of documents. We'll, in, we'll include in our document request a request for any corrective action plans that have already been drafted um, in anticipation of uh, the DEA uh, trying to take even an initial step towards enforcement of um, failure for them to meet their obligations under the law as it relates to distribution. We'll see. You, you may be right. They may have it already prepared. Um, well, I, we, yeah. I have a, no, I have, yes, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. I was just gonna say, I think if some of those things never reach DEA's chief counsel's office, those statistics would be skewed because if they think that it's not going to go anywhere, why would they bother to send anything up? They would just rather take care of it amongst themselves. That would almost be like, uh, you know, police officers or detectives maybe issuing, you know, tickets or summons instead of going to the DA to file, you know, some sort of prosecutorial thing because they know it's not going to go anywhere. So it's my understanding that a lot of things are being taken care of at the field level and never making it even up to the Office of Chief Counsel. So there's no action even being threatened because there's no belief that if you did, anything would happen? I mean, I can't speak for, you know, the totality. There may be some things, but uh, I understand that, I guess, the, uh, however you want to put it, uh, the, the, the lack of support, I guess, for, for the field uh, isn't lost on them, and it's sort of, why bother? Right. Um, it, I have a number of questions that I have not asked. Um, I, um, we will go through them, and there may be a few of them that we might send to you if you all would be so kind as to address them. Um, but what I would like each of you to do, is there anything that you think is important for us to know as we move forward on this topic that has not been covered today? Anything you want to add to the testimony you've given or to the answers you've given that you think is important to put on the record before we close out this particular roundtable? Senator, I just want to reiterate that in my experience, the men and women of DEA are dedicated and they are believers in what they're doing. And if given the opportunity, they want to fight this fight. And I just hope that that's kept in mind, that these are people who really do want to go out there. The obligations under the CSA are to ensure the health and safety of the people of this country. And whether that's ensuring that patients can get access to medicines or stopping people who are threatening the safety of the, the, the American public, that's what everyone at DEA wants to do. And I just want to make sure that that is remembered in all of this. I'll echo Mr. Novak's, the, the people of DEA, the agents investigators are dedicated 100%. They want to do the right job. They want to be able to have the tools in their toolbox to be able to do 
what's necessary to stem this, this epidemic. And I want to go a little further, I want to, what Mr. Ranazizi said. Opioid drug addiction is a gift that keeps on giving. Whether the companies pay fines, whether they submit corrective action plans, whether people go to jail, those things sort of are final. The people that have addiction problems, those addiction problems keep going and going and going. And the ultimate, some people die. And as Mr. Rand has easy said, education is a very big part of, of a lot of that. DEA used to have demand reduction people. And years ago, that's been taken away. So now if somebody wants to go talk at a school, that's, that's fine. I think reinstating a demand reduction program within DEA and having dedicated people to go out there to do that, I think would also be a big help to, to that. As Mr. Randy Zazie said, third grade, fourth grade, you have to start young and early to be able to stem this. Well, first, I, I just want to thank you for having this hearing, or this round table. Um, it, it sheds light on, on some areas that really need to be addressed, and one of which is the repeal of this legislation. Uh, I want to also echo what my colleagues have said, as far as DEA, uh, when, these, when these investigators and agents are out there doing their job, and they do it extremely well. Uh, I used to watch them and watch the way they worked and how they worked. And uh, they used to take nothing but grief from, from the industry. I mean, I remember one article, they said, oh, DEA's methods are draconian, okay? These are people who are out there protecting the public health and safety. They have no motive other than to do their job. And, you know, people say, oh, I did, I, they do their job and go home. A lot of these people don't go home until late into the night, especially when we're pairing to do an ISO or, or a, a large group of uh, uh, registrants who are going to be served with orders to show cause. You have to be a true believer in order to work and work effectively in that agency. My hat's off to DEA. I, some of the most satisfying work that I ever did with DEA was over that Office of Diversion Control and the investigators that are there. And I just want to tell you that uh, they are that, that one, one layer that's between, uh, you know, keeping people safe and having a lot more people die. And so I, I just wanted to know that people, people outside of the agency still watch them and are impressed with what they're doing. So that's it. Well, I think um, the testimonies you all have given about your former colleagues at DEA are um, certainly backed up by my experience working with law enforcement for so many years. Uh, you go, don't go into this line of work because it's safe, glamorous, or that you get rich. Um, you go into this line of work because you're driven by a sense of public duty, and I think it's terrific that you took the time to acknowledge that that is still the case by uh, the rank and file and many of the folks at DEA. Obviously, we've got some problems there in terms of um, folks that are, uh, in your opinion, Mr. Yonker, are the obstructionists that are not supporting the field in terms of this work, and this legislation was... Um, clearly not helpful in terms of removing a valuable tool that was a deterrent. Let's be honest. The ISO statute was a deterrent to some of the largest companies in America that there were serious and significant consequences if they didn't do it by the book. When you remove that deterrent, then things get even sloppier. And when things get sloppy in the area of opioids, people die. People die. Innocent people die. I mean, it was in this room not too long ago that we had a heartbreaking, uh, just a heartbreaking roundtable with uh, the families of people who had died of overdoses. Um, and that was a, the company that now the CEO has been finally arrested um, and is being criminally charged. But they actually had an informal sales slogan within their company on fentanyl, start them high and hope they don't die. Um, when that kind of stuff is going on, then it's up to the DEA, it's up to 
uh, public servants to hold uh, these companies accountable. So we will do our best to undo uh, the damage that has been done and restore this tool to the DEA. I think it's an important one. And we really thank you for your time and your energy and, frankly, the slings and arrows that you're taking um, for coming out and being public in your criticism of what happened with this legislation. Uh, so certainly all of us bear a responsibility. We do sometimes um, allow the other folks to thoroughly vet legislation and when we hear certain things we say, oh, well, it's okay then, without double checking and triple checking. And given the subject matter, there should have been more double checking and triple checking and I'll start that by saying I should have done more double checking and triple checking of the legislation. As a former prosecutor, I should have taken it upon myself uh, to double check that the DEA was really supportive of this bill rather than just marginally withdrawing their opposition to the bill and I should have dug even deeper to figure out what impact this was going to have on enforcement. So we're going to try to correct this mistake. I'm going to work as hard at it as I know how. I really appreciate your time here today. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Senator.